So thank you for the opportunity to speak to this seminar. Um, when I actually found this little, um, I had an initial different icon for the picture and Joanne said no. So I found another one and it was only a happy coincidence that it actually looks like the AMCAST icon. So I was actually quite happy with it and um, that's my talk, thank you. No. Uh, <laughs> Patient engagement, I was tasked to talk about that. So I'm hoping that um, it's bringing a different perspective to all the data and all the quant data that you've been hearing this afternoon. So for something a little bit different. Okay. All right, so just a quick outline. Um, what is patient engagement? Why do we want to do it? And how do we do it? And then I'm going to talk a little bit about a stakeholders workshop that I did during my PhD. And then um, a bit of recent um, work that we've started doing and using a co-design session to engage our patients, or we like to call them consumers because we haven't diagnosed them having the disease yet. So patient engagement is increasingly recognised as an important part of healthcare. So by engaging these patients in their care, they are actually better able to make informed decisions um, about the care options available to them. In addition, health resources can be better used if they are aligned with patients' priorities, leading to better healthcare outcomes and cost savings. Not to mention engaging patients may increase communication between healthcare providers and their patients. So you may want to engage the patient in education or a tool development or to inform policies. Um, there are many ways to patient engagement. So you can use low level activities such as feedback and surveys or with high level engagement such as co-design or stakeholders workshop or forums. So in the last few years working in primary care, I've been involved in um, conducting stakeholders forum to disseminate research findings and obtain feedback and the, you know, on the outcomes and priorities from these stakeholders, which provide a further direction of research and policy change. I've also been involved in co-design um, processes to develop clinical decision support tool, um, Joanne's work in AMS, and health platforms in general practice to assist GPs in providing better decision support for their patients. So now I just want to touch on a couple of um, two examples of patient engagement um, in antimicrobial stewardship. So towards the end of my PhD, I conducted a stakeholders workshop. So to disseminate the re results of the study to our key stakeholders, which are our primary care providers and our parents of young children. Um, so I probably should say the PhD is actually on um, trying to find the knowledge understand the knowledge and attitude of healthcare providers, parents and, uh, and also parents of young children in managing and preventing respiratory tract infection in, in this cohort. So we wanted to engage the key holders to identify priority areas, to focus on this intervention and to also contribute to, contribute to an intervention design using the theor theoretical domains framework and the COMBI model. Um, firstly, I disseminate the results from my study. So I grouped them together and I told them a bit of um, the summary of the outcome findings. And the participants were then divided into two groups. Um, they were given butcher's papers and post-it notes so they can jot down any thoughts or inspiration generated from the discussion that they, they have. And talk about ideas that were considered as important to inform the development of future interventions. So after, the, um, after um, I think it was 45 minutes, I let them go and do their thing. The group were then brought back together and then we had a um, key person to talk about what their group were, you know, what their interests were and then had that discussion in a broader group. So the ideas were collated by the research team and analysed based on three main areas. So the first area was um, managing respiratory tract infections. So I like to have that little, um, you know, the little kitty slides about the children. And also we, we spoke a little bit about antibiotics and, and the role in primary care. We also talk about influenza vaccination as a prevention strategy and also, of course, hand hygiene as a prevention strategy to um, 
preventing or reducing respiratory tract infection in young children. So the stakeholders workshop provided some really interesting work insights. So while all areas of research were seen as important, strategy to improve hand hygiene compliance was seen as the most easy and achievable area to reduce respiratory tract infection in the cohort. But because I was already involved in the antibiotic scene, working with um, in here, I wanted to talk about what they thought about reducing antibiotic prescribing or inappropriate prescribing and antibiotic. So, but when I pressed them about inappropriate prescribing and the use of antibiotics, the GPs in the room actually thought they were already doing really well. And the parents said they were very knowledgeable. So if they wanted us to do anything in the antibiotic areas, it has to be someone else's problem. So it's not about them because they already know how to do it properly. So the benefit was not seen as being useful. So they really pushed for hand hygiene. So I'd like to say I'm really glad that, well, not that I'm really glad I'm not in hand hygiene, but I'm actually feeling a lot better being in the antibiotic space, working with these amazing people. So there are limitations to, this, to my stakeholders forum, not all stakeholders forum. We only could recruit a small number of participants um, into the study and only two participants were from the initial research group. But nonetheless, a range of primary care providers included GPs, we had pharmacists, we had healthcare professionals such as ID physicians, we had microbiologists in the room, actually provided a range of experience um, needed to undertake the format, format of the meeting. And it was a great way to engage consumers or patients and participants to disseminate the research findings. So I want to move on to something that um, we've, done, we've been doing recently. It's the co-design um, phase of our study. So we conducted a co-design session. The aim was to explore what information healthcare providers and consumers may want in a, in a patient decision aid or information about common infections seen in primary care. And we also wanted to explore how the um, healthcare providers and consumers want this in information delivered. So we recruited 11 participants. We had five healthcare pro um, providers, so three, with, three were GPs, one practice nurse and one pharmacist. We also had a, um, six participants ranging, um, I think it was a 17 year old and maybe in their 60s or 70s, I don't know. So we had an older lady, an uh, older gentleman, we had a dad, we had a mum, and then we had a middle aged single male and a 19 year old male. I like to call him a boy, but he's the so this was actually really good because it gave us a variety of um, participants that we can actually explore. So in the workshops, we divided into two sections. The first section was about having in what sort of important information that we wanted in a clinical decision, um, in a decision support tool. So if you have a look at the um, categories on the right-hand side, we gave them bronchitis as an indication for them to have a to have a look at. So we gave them examples like what causes bronchitis, what are the management for bronchitis, what sort of complications that patients may expect, prevention, um, when you should see a doctor. So we gave them some of these um, categories and then we asked them to rank um, these categories the importance from one to 11. And then we asked them to critique some of the current patient information aids. So this is only three out of the five that I gave them to critique. I just wanted them to have a look at, um, so the, the categories that we had in there are actually there, like you know what causes acute bronchitis, how long does it last, so is the natural um, duration, um, what are the likely benefits and risk, um, and things like what is it, what causes it, and, and so forth, and prevention. So these three out of the five were actually two pages, so they're front and back. And then we had two other ones that are just one page only. So some of the feedback that we got, because then we, after they ranked them, they, they actually critiqued the um, decision aids or information. And then we talked about it in a group, what they like about each and every one of them. 
So the first theme is pretty much keep it simple and keep it relevant. So basically, one just said it just needs an editor to cut out about half the words. So they actually wanted just one page, not two. And the other thing is, of course, have the important stuff in the front page and have the relevant stuff on the back page. Then the question begs, why would you bother having a back page if it's irrelevant? Um, balancing between words and pictures. So some of them are really good with a lot of pictures but they want a bit of word to go with it. So it's actually a bit of a balancing act. And of course it has to adapt to the correct setting. Um, avoid confusing your audience. So don't put in things like um, that doesn't flow because your audience is not going to understand. If they don't understand, they're not likely to want to read it and, and or even educate them in any way. Um, the other thing is very important of format and layout. You want it to actually suit your eyes, not something that is going to explode your brain like my first um, page initially with Joanne. Um, so it's actually easy. So things like that, it's easy to read and it draws your attention to it with the picture on the side, the decoration on the side. So it's actually um, pleasing for the patient to look at. Oh, and then after that, we asked them, so we show them that, and then after that, we asked them to rank one to 11 again of those, um, of those 11 categories. So we've got some very interesting findings. So I combined all the healthcare providers together, and then I combined all the um, patient um, together. So you've got before and after. What is actually really interesting here, actually, no, I've so you can see that this is what they call a slope graph. So before and after. So um, when to see a doctor, obviously, was very important to healthcare providers for the patients to know. So it actually stayed the same before and after. Some actually dropped, like course of the disease drop, and some actually went up. So management options went up. But if you have a look at the consumers, the six consumers that we combine them together, what we, I actually thought it was really interesting is um, the healthcare providers all thought went to see a doctor was really important, okay? Um, however, if you have a look at the consumers, didn't even make the tops, or actually make the, didn't even make the top five. And then after we gave them, you know, the exercise to do and, and critique the thing, actually dropped to number 10, okay? So I just want to highlight that there's discrepancy of what, um, healthcare providers think patients want to what patients actually want themselves. So this is something that is really important and, and one of the biggest reasons why we want to engage our patients because we might be making all these resources and sending them out <coughs> and it's not what the patient actually wants so therefore it won't be used. So that's another reason the co-design involving patient engagement is really important. Um, now we hammer on about, you know, it's really important that patient knows about the risk of antibiotics, they'll scare them, blah, 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 blah. Doctors and healthcare providers going, hmm, whatever. It went up for a little bit, but it is still not the most important thing for a um, consumer. Maybe the message is not getting out there. Maybe we really do need to skip the crap out of them. I don't know, but I think it's something that we need to really seriously think about. Um, I mean, there's other things too. And one of the really um, interesting is challenging assumptions. So before we did this, and then we challenged, you know, what their assumptions would be. Some of them didn't even change, like when to see a doctor and so forth. There's something else we need to unpack a bit. I just want to also say this is really preliminary results. I haven't really thought through that much about it. So the other second part of it was, um, yes, you've got the content. What are we going to do about delivering? So how are you going to deliver these um, resources to your patients? Do they want it? When do they want it? How do they want it? And are they ever going to use it? And that's really important too, because if you've developed all these wonderful things and you've got the wrong delivery mode, your patients, one, not going to say it, second, they don't care. So we then talked about, as a group discussion, you know, would you want written handouts? No. Would you like the fridge mag magnet to a website, you know, like you can just put in there to remind you? Is it about posters, pamphlet in the waiting room? How do you want it delivered? Do you want a video? Do you want the doctor talking to you about the, pro um, the topic? And so forth. And we gave them examples of these. 
It was actually very clear towards the, um, towards the end of our um, co-design session that information and delivery can come into three parts in a patient's journey. It might be before the consultation. So for example, if it's something before the consultation, patients might like to download some website information about the condition that they have. They might want to have a checklist that they can tick off. Uh, do I have a temperature of over 39 degrees or um, have I been breaking out and sweat for no reason as the kids been, you know, doing this? Yeah, they may want a checklist that they may want to think about. So in that checklist, or in games, the games are really for the kids or the adult, I don't know, <laughs> or the male adult. I think there was a couple of male adults that says, yeah, we want games. Um, so it might be the checklist that they may want to bring that checklist to the GP and discuss that during a consultation and that can form part of their shared decision aids. They may want to have posters in the waiting room that they can actually have a look at and certainly there's plenty, there are plenty of posters around that may be helpful. Um, and then and also um, GPs can talk to the patients about their you know, indication or, or the disease and then they may have um, proper resources that links into our clinical decision support tool that you can print out the resources to, send, to give to the patient to send home with them. And also, of course, after the consultation, they may actually have the pamphlet. They may also have incorporated a little checklist that tells you um, if your symptoms worsen and these are the symptoms, not just if your symptoms worsen, but what they are. So that would actually allow the patient to say, oh, do I need to go to doctors? No, I don't. I just need to rest for another three days for my cold or I really need to go to the doctors, uh, the hospital because I've got sepsis. Um, there's also the website information. So this, is, this actually forms a cycle for um, the patients. So next step, so um, we've done our first co-design, so we're in talks with a um, graphic designer now. We're going to produce some of these information that we've spoken in here, and then we're going to bring it back to the second co-design session in February for the um, same participants to critique what we've, um, what we've designed. And then from there, they can make, we can actually then refine the tool and we're going to look at piloting across 10 general practices for feasibility and acceptability study. Um, so what are the lessons learned? So I think we've already talked about the importance of patient engagement. So we, if we want to develop something that we want the patient to use or our end users to use, you really need to involve, involve them in the development. Um, very easy, what we talked about before is how different the GP thinks and how or the healthcare providers thought that patients wanted and very differently what patients wanted themselves. Um, people have asked me, why did you involve the healthcare providers and consumers in the same co-design session? Um, because there may be some power imbalance between the two. Um, I thought it was actually a good idea to have them all together in the same room because then that they can have any issues that they can talk about that um, your healthcare providers may, may not be aware of and they're actually open to hearing what the consumers are saying about um, what they need. Um, it's also a really great way to develop a tool or, or product and this is really important that it's acceptable for both healthcare providers and consumers because they are your end users. Thank you. Thanks, Ruby. Um, so, so, you know, it's early work for Ruby, but I think um, it's really interesting because I know many of us in the room have probably been guilty of writing patient information.